Welcome to today's SNAP session, Managing Access Deliveries and Operations During COVID-19. I'm Suzanne Silverman, Editorial Director of Multi-Housing News, and I'm talking with Kent Woodyard, Business Development Leader at Amazon, Cyrus Claffey, Founder of Butterfly MX, and Stephen Boyack, CEO of CA Management. We are recording this session, and it will be available for later viewing. In addition, we're going to leave some time at the end to answer your questions, but please feel free to submit them at any time during the webinar. Internet retailing was already on the rise before the arrival of the novel coronavirus. With most Americans now staying home and social distancing the required norm, home deliveries of packaged goods have increased still more, with the added challenge of hands-free delivery. In many cases, the property management office itself is now closed. So let's talk about how best to manage deliveries during these difficult times. Cyrus, why don't you start us off and tell us how property access has changed during COVID-19? Hey, thanks, Sue. I'm glad to be here, and that's a great question. Um, property access has changed a lot, just like the world around us. Um, Pre-COVID-19, property access was really about enabling convenience for the people and services that mattered. When we spoke with developers and property managers, they were primarily concerned with providing their residents with a living experience that matched their lifestyle, one in which access to anything was just a tap on their smartphone away. However, with all the health and wellness concerns surrounding COVID-19, we all know that people's lifestyles have changed dramatically. Now, we're all being asked to work from home, interact less with others, and do most of our shopping online. So property access has gone from enabling resident convenience to ensuring resident safety. And um, we've seen this change most dramatically in how people are using our products and services. Um, just one example, some of our built-in security functionality, such as video calling, has seen a five times usage rate increase in the last four weeks alone. This is primarily because on-site staff are relying on it to see and speak with visitors, oftentimes from a remote location or behind a security desk in the lobby where they're trying to adhere to social distancing guidelines before granting access to the property. We've also seen residents now start to use touchless door opening functionality in our mobile app. And so they're using our mobile app to unlock the building's door instead of using their keys, key fobs, or pins. And lastly, I have to mention that with the onslaught of deliveries due to the explosion of e-commerce, we've seen a huge demand for a package room solution as property managers see the value of the partnerships we've created with providers such as Amazon, in which we grant UPS and FedEx drivers access to complete their delivery without the involvement of building staff. Okay, thanks, Cyrus. Kent, can you talk about how delivery has changed? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and, and thanks again for having us on. Um, it's been a, a, a crazy couple months, and so we're, uh, we're, it's an important conversation. We're happy to be a part of it. I think for us, what we've seen is, is no surprise here, obviously, uh, highly elevated levels of usage. Um, and, and really kind of a switch in how people view e-commerce, not just Amazon, but e-commerce in general, where it's less of just a convenient way to shop, and it's become more of a, of a public utility almost. It's like an essential lifeline. Uh, if you can't go outside and if all, you know, a, a good percentage of brick-and-mortar retailers are closed, um, then online ordering is really your only option. Um, and so that's what we're seeing from our customers. Just to read one quick anecdote, anecdote this is from a a lady posted this on social media saying, thank you, Amazon. Thank you, Whole Foods. Your grocery delivery saved us. A family member was hospitalized, not flu related. And with all the insanity at the stores, I was able to be a caregiver and stock the house with food all at once. Hashtag lifesaver. And so I think that that highlights kind of what we're seeing and what I'm sure the property managers here on the call are seeing as well, where a higher volume, that's especially true with things like grocery delivery, uh, fresh, fresh delivery and groceries have long been kind of the last uh, remaining holdout where, where the majority of the shopping was happening on brick and mortar uh, in physical stores. But we've had a kind of forced adoption over the past six weeks for people who maybe weren't comfortable with it or just didn't think it was their cup of tea. Now they have no choice. And so they've had to, to convert to online grocery shopping. Um, and so that is, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of that as well, where folks are now just depending on this. And so in terms of the other kind of cohort and for my, my role here specifically at Amazon, I work on our, our hub locker team. So we have Amazon package lockers in uh, almost 4,000 properties across the country, in addition to another 8,000 retail lockers that are out in front of, you know, 7-Elevens, Whole Foods, Rite Aids. And so these kind of these unattended pickup options. 
And that unattended part is obviously very critical these days as, as we're all trying to practice social distancing and not just protect the customers, but also protect our delivery drivers who are out there on the streets as an essential service, but, but also wanting to, to not have to interact if we can avoid it. So these delivery lockers are, are becoming a key part of that, where, as Cyrus mentioned, working with Butterfly, you know, we're able to offer access to the building uh, and then access to these lockers where the packages are, are ultimately delivered without requiring any, any human touch or any point of contact. Um, so that's another thing we're hearing from our customers. If, if by customer I'm talking about kind of multifamily housing, property managers, and, and on-site staff is that there's just this realization that, hey, we've got a mountain of packages that are coming into our building every day. Uh, we don't really have capacity because our leasing office is closed. As you mentioned, Suzanne, uh, our, our on-site staff is, is operating kind of on a, on a, on a shoestring uh, availability. And so we need to find a way to get these packages managed, sorted <clears throat> into the hands of our residents without actually having to, to shuffle them and, and hand them off. So what are the automated solutions for that? What are the ways that we can use tech to do that and, and get people the things that they need while, <clears throat> while keeping everybody safe? And Stephen, can you give us that property operation perspective? How have these changes to property access and to delivery caused you to change your operations during COVID-19? And uh, what are you hearing from your residents as well? Um, well, we manage both student housing properties as well as multifamily properties. So we have a pretty wide view of the marketplace and you know, what the different age ranges and um, consumers um, are looking for right now and how are they responding I think you know first it would be interesting to level set a little bit and let you know that <clears throat> student housing properties today uh, at least ours are averaging about 35 percent give or take occupancy most of uh, the kids that could go home did um, and on the multifamily properties occupancies have certainly stayed stable around 94 95 percent and obviously all of those people are staying home. Um, our operations typically very service centric, and you know, as was mentioned earlier by Ken and Cyrus, um, our offices are staffed but are closed. Our maintenance teams are still staffed but are working on only essential work orders right now. Um, concierge desks are staffed but um, are velvet roped off or plexiglass off so that they can still provide the services that people expect, but. <clears throat> definitely under different circumstances um, packages across really all of our properties today depending on that wide swath of occupancy that I talked about are averaging about anywhere from a 50 to 150 percent increase um, and the packages are are being managed through various package rooms package lockers and in some cases some of the amenity spaces that have been taken uh, out of use have been used as triage areas. Um, you know, the residents being home uh, has really helped in our abilities to manage the tremendous increase in input there. Uh, the packages oftentimes would be left with us all day and then picked up either at night or early in the morning, but <clears throat> now we have a system where Packages are being scheduled for pickup so that we can make sure that there's not any large groups coming at one time and that uh, the packages can be um, sanitized and handed to the residents before they take them back to their homes. Um, also, I think interesting, we've mentioned food deliveries. Uh, food deliveries across the board are up about 60% at our properties, and those are also being managed a little bit differently as different systems were used, Butterfly being one of them, to, to get those people through the door into the residents' front doors to make those face-to-face -face deliveries. Now those are being uh, held at the front door with scheduled pickups by the residents so that we can limit the amount of foot traffic of people both in and through the common areas of the building. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Let's talk about um, how much the implementation of technology has ex um, has been accelerated to bring these three components together in recent months, the access tools, the delivery, and the operations. Um, what was happening leading into this time, and what have you seen since everybody's been home? Yeah, I mean, this is um, Cyrus, too. Um, you know, just from, from our perspective, you know, what we've seen has been a rush by 
operators to implement technologies that provide the remote-based access and control that I think Steve was referring to and Kent alluded to in terms of efficiently getting packages on site uh, in order to safely facilitate deliveries and visitor management at their properties before you know uh, construction was eliminated as an essential service. Yeah, and, and, uh, and the I would, plus one to that was sorry, was it? Oh, sorry, Steve. Um, but just to say, yeah, it, it, I think it just ra ratcheted up the urgency. So folks who who had maybe been exploring an automated package uh, delivery option, or you know, they'd gotten through the pain of Q4 last year and thought, man, that was a mess. But hey, we've got ourselves some time until the holidays come up this year to to kind of make space or carve out the budget for it. I mean, we are seeing right now at Amazon in, in April, the Q4 levels of volume, uh, and, and Stephen shared some helpful statistics there just on kind of e-commerce in general. But uh, so seeing that level of volume happen now is, is really not something that anybody obviously anticipated. Um, and so both, on, both on the Amazon front, if you tried to order anything on Amazon recently, you know that we're kind of deprioritizing non-essential items to create capacity for, for food, for healthcare, for household staples. Uh, but that really is just to, to remove constraints on the entire supply chain as um, we didn't have that kind of six month ramp that we normally have going into Christmas to prepare for this. Um, so I think that's that's the one the one piece is just uh, driving urgency saying, hey, we got to figure this out now because this is kind of uh, posing a, a challenge to our residents and a challenge to our properties. Uh, but then also, obviously, you never wish for something like this and, and nobody ever wants to see a a crisis like the one we're going through happen, but the one thing that comes out of them is often it forces creativity, it forces innovation, it forces you to think, okay, like what are we going to do to address this current problem? And then that often leads to innovations that have have an impact down the road. And so mm -hmm. we're uh, we're doing a lot of that with with our our systems, uh, our, our processes, our people. Uh, and I can share a little bit more about that maybe here in a little bit, but just, just working on even driving other inefficiencies within the, the supply chain itself that require even reducing further uh, human in, interaction, um, delays, just, or, or just manual steps, manual entry, whether it's access to the building or access to the packages. Uh, and I think that's something that we're, we're going to continue to focus on as long as this goes on. Yeah, I think and building I'm sure on what Cyrus said a minute ago, there's um, mm -hmm. I think the folks that have had a lot of these technologies in place are starting to realize some of the pent up value that was in them with uh, you know the video interactions that Cyrus mentioned, with the integrations that exist between the different um, technologies and the functionality that that's now bringing to bear, um, and also you know for instance with um, with the butterfly system or other other internal access points being technology enabled being able to track who's in the building where they're at the amount of time they spent there and all that is now showing itself to be uh, tremendously valuable so i guess that begs yeah. the, the the big looking ahead question i mean how how much do you see these as short-term changes and what will become the new normal well, I think uh, no one would argue that some of the forced changes that have happened and the amount of time that we've been you know, held under them, there's going to be a tremendous amount of stickiness just in behavioral change. And then there's going to be, I think, a lot of change in, in just people's comfort levels with things. So I think, you know, things like um, access systems at the front door or even just tech enabled access to me is has always been in my mind a table stake and that's been an argument with a lot of owners i think they will now see the value uh, that access controlled access and, and virtual access bring to the table because i think you know we've seen a tremendous increase in the amount of virtual service that we've been able to provide you know another stat our work order is because we're only doing essential work orders are down uh, by 51%, uh, we've been able to actually service 75% of the work orders that come in through virtual means. Um, so the service levels are remaining very high, although our, our individuals are not interacting as much. So I think, you know, things like hand-free, touchless, virtual, all of those type of technologies are going to be highly sought after and are going to be a little bit easier to get into place so that we can can serve the influx of packages, the influx of groceries. I think that's certainly going to be sticky. I know uh, for sure in my family there was a lot of hesitance to not be the guy to pick out the tomatoes, but uh, they're looking pretty good. So we'll probably stick with it. 
Yeah, yes, I think okay, um, the, 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 Oh, go ahead, Ken. Okay, real, real quick. I'll save I'll save the good stuff for you. <laughs> um but uh yeah, I think a couple of different things that we're going to see going forward and, and we talked about this a little bit while we were preparing for this webinar that this whole hearkening back to oh we can't wait to get back to normal and we can't wait for life to go back to how it used to be i think we all realize to some degree that's going to look different than it looked in january and and i think a hallmark of that is both as Stephen was saying uh an elevated level of of online orders of e-commerce driven not just by the change in behavior but by every every brick and retail order that i know right now if they are shut down their focus is on ramping up their their online store ramping up their e-commerce capabilities you know making that a more core part of their business and so we're kind of seeing this rising tide across the across the industry. Um, and then the other behavior, I think, is we all realize that just this idea of social distancing and, and maybe trying to limit interactions, at least for the next couple of quarters and maybe for the next year or so, that's going to take some time before that kind of that kind of starts to be where we just hug every stranger on the street, if that's what we were doing before. And so I think that those two things combined are going to lead to an increase in packages and then an increased expectation from customers. Uh, to be able to to receive them securely, efficiently, uh, but without requiring a, a human handoff. And so those, I think, are going to kind of be the, the societal changes or the behavioral changes that continue to, to impact the conversations like this one going forward. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, you know, um, obviously at the beginning of this, we reached out to our customers to just kind of um, – help them understand how they can use Butterfly MX to kind of restrict access to the package room, to help with social distancing at the front entrance of the building, you know, um, and how residents, of course, can can use the mobile app to kind of have touchless entry into the building. Um, you know, and a point that I think both Kent and, and Steve have made is like, look, you learn so much from how your customers are using your technology platform. And then, you kind of bake that into the platform as you go forward and you share that with all your customers so that everybody can benefit from kind of those things that people are using in the wild. You know, we've basically used um, kind of an idea from a customer where uh, with our package room, you send a virtual key that has a limited duration and length to a customer who has a package in the package room. They have to come get it and then they, they leave, but that restricts access to the package room and helps create social distancing. Um, you know, I think at the very highest level, uh, we believe that convenience will come back as we exit the COVID-19 world. Um, however, like Kent and Stephen, I think most people, you know, we think that safety and security are going to remain an important part of the resident experience in the post-COVID-19 world. And so that's kind of here to stay. Okay. Well, as we're talking about the future and, and how this extends to other um uh, aspects of life um there's not a whole lot i think of use of unit level service providers like dog walkers and house cleaners right now but um as we get back into normal life whenever that may be and these kind of services um become more active again um Stephen, with your properties how do you see access technology applying to these businesses to ramp as as uh, as they're able to ramp back up, and then Cyrus, I'd love to hear from you about that as well. Yeah, you know, you're right. The the service provision, which really was um, probably the biggest demand on the resident side coming into this, is certainly slowed to a stop with both the residents now being at home and being able to provide a lot of these things for themselves. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the service providers are <clears throat> are also a little anxious about coming into all of these different homes. Um, I think that that will ramp back up and I'll go back to saying not only uh, the access points, but the integration between the access points, between the front door, between the common areas and the units themselves will be more important than ever so that a dog walker can get from the front door to the unit to pick up the dog, to the dog wash or the, the pet run, and, and back to the unit and back out the front door without having to come into contact with any of our staff or, um, you know, or the resident. Nobody will have to stand and pull a key and do a lot of touching and, and things like that. And then the other thing that that will do, again, as far as the, the concept of contact tracing, if uh, that becomes necessary at any point in the future, you'd know who came in, where they went, 
um, you know, when they came in, when they left. So I think both the technologies themselves and the integration amongst them is going to be uh, essential to future operations of the building. Yeah, I couldn't agree um, more uh, with that. I mean, basically, for many years, we've heard from multifamily owners and operators who want to provide their residents with a high-touch living experience, right, but don't have the capital to invest in the workforce to support this. So instead, um, they've been forming partnerships with third-party service providers, you know, the WAGs of the world, uh, the Rovers, the Tass Rabbits, um, to provide their residents with a high-touch living experience. Um, in, in order for those partnerships to work, the operators need to be able to grant access to the front of the building. And so they've turned to us to provide one-time, uh, you know, verified access to these third-party service providers. I think as Steve just touched on, you know, in a post-COVID-19 uh, world, uh, you know, there's going to be greater concern about limiting access to the service providers to just those areas that they need to get to inside the building. Uh, so we anticipate you know, playing a much more important role to kind of meet that need uh, in the future. I think the other thing is sure. grocery deliveries, as Kent was saying, become more ubiquitous in the buildings. How will the buildings handle those? You know, we don't really have currently uh, areas to store a lot of non-perishable or perishable items. You know, we might have some refrigeration, but certainly not enough to handle, you know, 60% of the residents ordering the groceries online. So whether they end up in a refrigerated storage room of ours or direct delivery to the resident's fridge, you know, that's something that's going to need to be figured out on a go forward. Yeah. If I could just make one more comment, Suzanne, I think, you know, one of the things we've been talking about, all of us have been focused kind of on the resident experience and consumer behavior and on kind of the end, called the end customer and the impact. Um, but one of the, the things that we always focus on is also like what's the property manager experience going to be like and, and a dynamic that we all see coming from this is not just health and behavioral, but, but economic. We know that um, rent is going to be a challenge for many folks in the months ahead. We know that that's going to tighten uh, margins and just operating budget for, for properties. Uh, hopefully not, but, but I'm sure there's going to be some, some evictions that result from this. And so all of that just places the, you know, kind of downward pressure on the, the, property management to bottom line ultimately. And so from that, I think what that's going to drive is a need for your on-site staff, for your on-site team to be as efficient as possible, as focused on the right things, which is going to be serving residents uh, and, and potentially filling vacancies. And so any time spent, if it's letting a dog walker into the building, if it's receiving a, a carrier delivery, if it's, uh, you know, shuffling around in a package room, trying to turn a route around and find the box for a resident, like all of those things, are going to be time time lost and time wasted by property staff. And so having automated, touch-free technological solutions for these things, I think is going to become that much more critical from a even come out from a from an efficiency and a in a budget standpoint. And I guess that can apply also to prospective tenants who who are touring the property. Some opportunities Absolutely. there, sir. Yeah, I think it'll become like a, oh, well, yeah, yeah, Cyrus has some thoughts there, but I think also becoming kind of an amenity that, that prospective tenants are looking for and expecting to see uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a differentiator. Yeah, I mean, look, just yeah. to tack on to, to Kent's point, I mean, I, I think that, like, what's happened is, is that people are now employing these technology uh, systems, you know, lockers, package rooms, you know, front entrance, smart intercom, you know, IP-based uh, access control, right? And they're employing it in a way kind of that they've never really um, done before. And they're seeing the value there, right? And to Kent's point, um, this is, this is going to only accelerate kind of going forward for a variety of different reasons. They're finally seeing the value. Uh, there may be economic pressure to, to try and do this. And, and we live at a very interesting time in the prop tech world, you know, and, and Steve has certainly seen this as kind of an old industry hand. Uh, who, who's been through different kind of waves. Um, but, you know, we finally have a, an ecosystem that's formed between all kinds of different prop tech companies that can provide different end-to-end -end solutions, whether it's us letting the UPS guy in the front door, handing them off to Amazon and then to our package room, right? It's a business partnership that we have. Or, you know, with us with some of the smart home companies or the smart home companies with, with energy management companies, right? So you have all of this going on. and um, 
you know, this, this event is, I think a lot of people feel is going to accelerate that adoption for the variety of reasons that I mentioned. I think when you think about um, self-guided tours, for example, you know, uh, in a world where on-demand service is everywhere, prospective residents want the ability to view the property on their own terms, right? Um, this will not only get accelerated because people are worried about getting too close to others, right? You, you want to kind of keep your social distance, so to speak. Um, to support this, what we've done is we're accelerating our investments in uh, common area technology that can be placed inside the building to grant prospective residents with access to the amenities and demo units via their smartphone, right? Um, and in some of the beta properties where we're actually testing this now, uh, property managers can send a one-time virtual key. It works at the front door, and then it'll work at various points throughout the buildings like the common areas. Um, it's a big step toward allowing prospective residents to view the property on their own terms while making operations more efficient by removing the need for, you know, individuals to guide new prospects to the property. And, and that was a point that Kent just made about kind of freeing up your staff's time, right, to focus on the more higher value things that they have to do while you use technology um, to, to implement other workflows and make the building more efficient. Anybody have anything more to add? I would just say it's, it's likely going to become another necessary arrow in the quiver. Um, you know, it'll solve existing long-standing problems of overflow touring or after-hours touring, but at the same time, to Cyrus's point, there will be a certain group of people that will either take a considerable amount of time or will never get back to feeling comfortable being in close quarters with, you know, large groups of people. So. Uh, to be able to serve them well is a strong desire of ours. Okay, so before we turn to Q&A, I would just like to ask each of you in say four or five words, but I won't grade you on whether you go under or over, um, could you please offer your key takeaways for our audience? Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll hop in first. Um, Expect, uh, just kind of summarize uh, a lot of conversations, expect uh, expect the volume that you're seeing now to maybe not stay at the same level, expect them to stay elevated at least, so elevated uh, volume of packages coming into your building uh, and, in, and expect an elevated desire for that to happen in a, in a hands-free, secure, and in uh, unattended manner. Okay, um, I would, Stephen? I would say, um, you know, a lot of the buzzwords that we've used or keywords around hands-free, touchless, virtual, all of those will remain, um, I think, highly necessary as we deal with the topics that we've talked about so far on this call. But, you know, one of the phrases I think that's been thrown around the last several years in designing buildings and amenities and services is the concept of being alone together and how people really enjoy, you know, that from a design and service standpoint. But I would challenge it and say for the immediate future, technologies that allow us to be together alone are the ones that um, will probably get the most play. And we've seen that with uh, Zoom meetings and you know all this other stuff. People are looking for opportunities for virtual engagement to make them still feel connected. So I think that's where a lot of our headspace is gonna be spent in the near future. Okay. That's a really interesting and, point, Steve. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, from my perspective, I think the things like the biggest takeaways are really you're going to see an acceleration of prop tech uh, into buildings and building operations. Um, and you're going to see security as an amenity um, that, that buildings use to, to market on. Okay, great. So let's turn now to some questions from the audience. First question, tenants still need to move in and out of apartments. What protocols do you see being put into place currently and how do you see that moving forward relative to the technology? You know, we're in the process of designing what we're calling a hands-free move-in uh, right now. And um, the technology that we've been talking about throughout this call is certainly gonna be a key player in that. You know, people have the opportunity to choose how they want to interact with us, just like 
they have in the past with, you know, whether it's email or text or whatever, now they'll be able to have kind of a white glove experience like we've provided in the past or the ability to do their entire move in all the way to, you know, scheduling the elevators, getting into the building, picking up any sort of keys or content. Um, we'll have a fully virtual option for them as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen, do more packages mean more cleaning regimens, more stricter cleaning regimens now? Um, well, you know, I think more people means um, more people in heightened um, concern mean elevated cleaning protocols for us. So, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've had an elevated um, cleaning regimen in place for all high touch surfaces in the building. Um, and on a go forward basis, we're looking at options uh, wide ranging. We're testing products that are actually nano coatings for a lot of the surfaces that have the ability to kill viruses for as much as six months or more. Uh, we're looking at lighting options that are also um, antimicrobial, microbial, um, and then also some of the ionized water um, technologies that are out there or products that are out there right now is kind of more of the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week type cleaning product. So I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of change in um, you know what's expected from residents and uh, you know the, the products and the technologies that are being utilized in all of our buildings. Yeah, hey, Suzanne, I'd just like to add something to that, too. It's like um, sure. one thing, yeah, one thing that um, we've been kind of looking at is how do you kind of automate your front entrance door opening, uh, meaning so that you don't have to touch the door handle and there's, you know, fairly inexpensive uh, kind of technologies that you can implement into the door frame that basically, uh, for example, if you're a Butterfly Max mobile app user, you use hand-free door opening on the mobile app and then the doors automatically open without you having to actually touch the door handles. So, um, you know, I, I think you might see more of that in the future. Okay. Are there certain requirements on site um, regarding turnover-related vendors, disinfecting training? Um, is it similar to the the requirements um, for other staff and for other delivery people as well. Anything different there? I would say, you know, for us, it's really, it's all uh, different and changing on a daily and weekly basis as we put together our protocols. You know, I don't know if the question is during the pandemic or after, uh, certainly during the pandemic, it's a, a tremendous, change and everything we've already talked about but but post as well I mean, we're looking at options of um, again providing typical turn services for the units but then maybe doing another level of um, sanitation or cleaning so that the unit can be you know, certified is delivered to the, to the new residents um, in that way and I don't know exactly what that'll look like today but that's definitely one of our internal conversations Okay, and while we're on the subject, um, Stephen, we have some questions regarding your anticipation for annual resident turnover this year and whether you anticipate more people preferring single family homes over rental properties, uh, just given this whole experience with COVID. You know, it's an interesting question because it's something that I've thought a considerable amount. Uh, about as well, I think, with people being pent up in small spaces for long periods of time, you would think that their desire would, um, you know, to be, to get out and have more space. But at least so far, what we're seeing is a dramatic increase in renewals at the properties, um, you know, both in the immediate and for the ones that we're doing well into the future. You know, I think for people who live in major cities, they consider the city itself to be uh, you know, an extension of their home. And so when the city opens back up and they they have access to uh, everything that it offers, you know, their world will change back again. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, for a limited number of people, maybe they'll 
we'll jump to houses or the suburbs, but at least what we're seeing right now in the data is we've probably seen a 15 or 20% uptick in renewals right now for existing residents. Okay, well, that's certainly good news for apartment properties. Um, I have a question regarding smaller properties, five to 15 units that don't have on site property management. What are your recommendations for managing those? Um, of course, some along those lines may not have package rooms either. How do they hand, how should they handle deliveries? What, what kind of recommendations do you have? And this could apply to each of you. Uh, this is, this is Kent here. If I could just allude cryptically to kind of forward looking, it's something that, yeah, currently the, the kind of package locker solutions that we have mm -hmm. for um, multifamily are, are really targeted towards probably 20 units and up, just given their size and the cost. But, but we are exploring options and opportunities and ways that we can kind of make that same technology available to down to you know a three a three flat walk up kind of a thing so so it is something we're working on if you ask hey you know looking forward what's the call out or what do we think it's going to look like in the next five years i think there's certainly going to be a, an influx of um solutions available that's kind of how you see a lot of technology adoption happen right it gets built for the biggest customers and you kind of add all the bells and whistles and throw everything at it and then from there a lot of the the trickle down innovation is, is able to impact some of the smaller smaller properties that yeah that don't have the on-site staff and don't have the space for a big a big unit yeah, this is Cyrus. So I, I would encourage uh, the questioners to actually go to our website and take a look at uh, our seven inch model uh, because we actually have a ton of smaller buildings, both um, kind of smaller building portfolios as well as individual HOAs that use our seven inch uh, touch screen at the front entrance of the building because residents can kind of self manage, right? They can provide remote access for delivery people. Um, they can use our virtual keys for service providers. And of course, you know, we're working in concert with Amazon to kind of provide a package solution both for large buildings and small buildings. So, um, you know, we're happy to answer any questions along those lines. Okay, well, that, uh, that leads into a question I had. And, and if we don't have any other questions, we may just close with this. Um, Kent, at the beginning, you were when when you answered your first question, you made reference to other uh, plans for expanding technology that you could talk about later, and that sounds like a perfect one. I'd love to hear both about what Amazon uh, has in mind as well as Butterfly, anything else, that any other uh, evolving technology solutions we should be looking out for? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, obviously with a company like Amazon, uh, that question could be a, a series of webinars, and a lot of them are outside of my limited little scope here in my, my own little, little corner of the company. Um, but some of the things that we're working on are, are yeah, continuing to, to focus on the hands-free aspect of it. One thing that we've done even even in the past month or so with COVID is is when a customer ships a uh, an Amazon order to a package, whether it's at their apartment or you know at the Whole Foods up the street. Um, they get a six-digit pin, and they also get a QR code. So we've really uh, prioritized and highlighted the QR code as the preferred option. Where the, that way, when they walk up to the locker, they just hold their phone in front of a little camera. It scans the code and pops open the door, so they don't have to actually physically touch the touch the unit. Um, another thing that we're continuing to invest in, and this is kind of complementary to what uh, what the Butterfly MX team is doing, allowing access to buildings, is there's a product called Key, Amazon Key. And that is specifically for Amazon delivery drivers, where when they are within kind of the, the range of the, the scanner, it, it puts a little a little um, Bluetooth device on the top of one of your door openers or maybe a gate access. And so that can allow carriers, uh, Amazon carriers specifically, to get secure access to first the, the building, um, but then even uh, eventually we're making the point where there could be uh, home access or garage access for, for multi or for single family houses, um, all, all touch free. I think the other area you're going to see continued innovation from Amazon and from others is around smart speakers. So Alexa uh, and Echo are obviously huge and, and used by a lot of people. But as integration with that increases and you get the whole smart home, um, you know, we've talked about uh, these tours and like use, use of cameras and, and touch free options for smartphones to do tours and things like that. But but appliances, uh, home essentials, rooms themselves, um, lights, all of that is going to be more and more kind of powered and all connected, I think, to the internet. Uh, and that allows, 
even more opportunity. I like what, what Stephen said is we're being together alone, you know, having our houses be you know, fully connected to the outside world. Um, I think it's something that Amazon is going to be continuing to, to invest in heavily. Cyrus, anything to add? Yeah. I, yeah oh, yeah, of course. On our side, um, actually, we, we have some kind of pretty cool stuff in R&D uh, that actually I don't want to uh, to mention here, but I just ask everybody to, to stay tuned for announcements from us in the future. But I did allude to our, our common area um, kind of access control platform. Uh, that we're now betaing with a few um, customers, which essentially uh, allows you, you know, if you're a resident, it extends that resident experience from the front entrance into the different common areas of the building. And it can be used in unattended touring, right, to provide, um, you know, a new prospect uh, access from, again, the front entrance of the building to various common areas all the way up into the demo units that uh, you want the new prospect to see and experience. Um, and then I would also just underscore, you know, our philosophy has always been um, to partner with best of breed companies like Amazon, like all the other prop tech companies in, in the uh, multifamily space, because, you know, we understand that um, every owner has their kind of smart home solution. They like every owner, like has a particular door lock that they've been using for a long time or that they like. Um, they have different after hours touring companies that they're talking to they like. So really our philosophy is to partner with all of them and the best of breed of those companies to, to have the flexibility where the owner can pick and choose with what works best for them. But we're always facilitating access uh, to the front entrance of the building and, and now to the common area and other parts of the building to provide that end to end solution, whether it's for uh, you know new prospects touring, whether it's for your packages, or whether it's just really to provide the resident a, a better um, experience throughout the building and controlling access to the various spaces that they want to go to. Okay, well, we are out of time. We will be sending you all notification when the red recording is available. And uh, tune in next Thursday for our next SNAP session, From Scaling Back to the Comeback, Everything Multifamily Marketers Need to Know During COVID-19. Thank you again to our sponsor, Butterfly MX, and thank you to all of our speakers for this very helpful discussion. Thank you, Suzanne. Yep. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Suzanne.